Hey, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'm excited to welcome Lynn Alton Schwartzer, the founder of Lynn Alton Investment Strategy and contributing analyst to ElliottWaveTrader.net, covering equities and alternative investments. Lynn, thank you for being here. The floor is yours. Happy to be here. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, this presentation is going to focus on some of the income strategies uh, that might be useful this decade. Obviously, the recent turmoil has showed, you know, it's funny, I, I, I titled this, um, you know, income strategies for a choppy decade uh, months ago. Uh, but recent events just kind of show, you know, what, what we're kind of dealing with this decade. Basically, we're at, a, we're at a pretty transitional decade in many aspects. And so let's jump right in. You know, I've used, I've used this slide in, in prior um, money show. Uh, presentations. And I really think it sets a stage for the macro environment that we find ourselves in. Um, yeah, and so the chart on the left shows a century of U.S. monetary and fiscal policy. And the orange line is three-month treasury rate, which is basically a proxy for any sort of short-term safe rates. Um, the blue line is the monetary base as a percentage of GDP. So it's basically money printing for the, for the base layer. And then the gray bars are federal deficits. Um, and what we see is that, you know, um, once, you know, they hit zero uh, in the early 1930s, and then they didn't hit zero again until 2008. Um, and when they run out of room to cut rates, they turn to money printing, they, they, they turn to quantitative easing. And they, they did that in both environments that, you know, the mechanisms for how they do that differed a little bit. Um, because the, the, you know, the monetary structures were different. Uh, but it was the same general result. Um, if we look at the chart on the right, uh, that's essentially U.S. debt as a percentage of GDP. And so the orange line is non-federal debt. So that includes household debt, uh, corporate debt, um, and it also includes state debt, which is pretty minimal. Um, and the blue line is federal debt. Uh, the reason I, I separate, separate that is because you know that's the entity that issues its own currency. Um, and so it has different ramifications for when it gets highly indebted. And we generally see, you know, I, I put... Um, uh, circles around the banking crises. These were basically, you know, generational peaks in terms of private debt um, relative to GDP, and they also coincided with uh, hitting zero in interest rates. Because when you're in an environment of interest rates constantly going down, that allows for for you know higher and higher debt to exist as a percentage of GDP because it keeps interest rates manageable even as that debt's increasing. But when you when you run out of you know room to keep pushing that down, it's really hard for debts to keep going higher. And you start to get a deleveraging event and a lot of money printing because it's too much debt in the system relative to base money. So they can't just let it, you know, collapse. We basically would have every bank collapse. So they they turn to this whole kind of wonky monetary environment. Now I think what's lost on some analysts is that these these types of weird transition points are historically like one, two punches, right? So we see here there's the private debt bubble. And then there's a the public debt bubble. And it's not really an accident that turned out like that because you had this private debt bubble, a long period of deleveraging, and you had a long period of economic stagnation. You had rising political populism. It was even worse overseas, lots of tensions building. And that actually was a big contributor to, to war. Um, and it was also a big contributor to why there were so many social programs done in the 40s. Because, you know, for example, when when soldiers came home from World War One, they were basically given a bus ticket and said, thanks for their service. Whereas when they came home from World War II, because they had all this backdrop of, you know, um, viewing Russia as like an, uh, you know, they didn't want communist sympathies to grow in the United States. They didn't want extremism. So they tried to thread the needle and say, okay, we're going to take care of soldiers better. We're going to, you know, get you educated. We're going to get you a home, things like that. So there was a lot of war driven programs and a lot of social programs in this period that try to offset a lot of the populism and the the anger that was building in this period. And we're kind of seeing a similar thing here. I mean, this was it. This, even though in many ways the 2010s decade was was prosperous for a lot of us, it was actually challenging for a lot of people in the working class. And as as we've seen around, you know, the world, we've seen rising political populism. And now we're kind of in that stage where we're going to see what the public sector is going to do about it. And th this, you know, this was a very inflationary decade, and I expected this to be an inflationary decade as well as some of these big social questions are worked through. And importantly, one of the things they did in the 1940s was they did yield curve control. So they kept rates low despite the fact that inflation was very high. This time so far, they tried a different approach. They tried to rapidly increase interest rates um, despite the fact that debt levels are still this high. And it's contributed to some of the, the pains we've seen now. So it kind of shows some of the, the challenging 
you know, kind of constraints that policymakers have and why that some of these things can be nonlinear. So that, that's kind of, you know, what I mean by a choppy decade. It, it's, it's, it's not an easy thing to forecast what's going to happen in this environment, you know, this environment. It, it's a very unusual time. It's not this, you know, constant glide down of lower, lower interest rates and, and higher and higher debt and equity valuations that we've been accustomed to for 40 years. Um, so, you know, the portfolio that's worked really well in this sort of declining rates, rising debt environment has been the classic 60-40 portfolio, which is very duration dependent, meaning that you, you know, you buy a lot of stocks, especially, you know, the S&P 500, which, which kind of, um, you know, a, a, aligned towards large and growth oriented equities. And then you buy like, you know, say 10 year treasuries or other long duration safe bonds as the 40%. And they've historically balanced themselves out pretty well. Um, going forward, if, you know, when we encounter, you know, this type of environment, this type of environment, that sort of 60-40 portfolio that works in this type of environment is no longer likely to be the best um, uh, setup. Basically, that that portfolio is very much geared to towards constant disinflation and lower rates because both equities and long duration bonds benefit from that, just, just not at the same time due to cyclical forces. So really what we need is some other assets in the portfolio that can help balance out some of those assets that otherwise benefit from disinflation. And so I, I, you know, I, I kind of use a framework of a three pillar portfolio uh, for this type of, you know, more more tumultuous or, you know, potentially uh, cyclically inflationary decade. And the three pillars are high quality equities, which really doesn't differ from, uh, you know, any other era. We basically want high quality equities, um, and then we want commodities and hard money exposure. Right? These are inflation hedges. These are monetary. Um, uh, instability hedges. Uh, these generally, you know, commodities generally do poorly most of the time, but the times where they do uh, well, they usually do amazing. And they often go up as everything else goes down, right? So in this type of environment, they're a good um, diversifier in a way that bonds really are no, no longer are a great diversifier for equities. And then lastly, uh, you know, because both of these categories can be very volatile, you know, instead of focusing on long duration treasuries, um, short duration treasuries, cash equivalents, money markets, things like that are still very useful, even in an inflationary environment, because they, they help take some of the edge off in terms of volatility, and they give us rebalancing opportunities into these scarcer asset classes. So I'll go kind of through examples of these three pillars. This is uh, Enterprise Products Partners. It's an energy pipeline uh, they pay a yield that's you know between seven and eight percent depending on the valuation at a given day. They have 25 years of consecutive annual distribution increases. They're currently trading a below average valuation. They you know they were in a bit of a bubble here. Uh, they obviously ran into some some turmoil around the COVID crash, but you know they weren't really fundamentally affected too much. And in many ways, this, this kind of period here looks a lot like it did in say you know 2010, where you know it got past the big crisis and you know had had still good days ahead of it. Um, and there's a number of other pipelines that are kind of in the similar position. One thing worth pointing out, you know, for people that are following the current banking crisis, the issue is that a lot of banks lent uh, very long duration, either in the form of loans or in the form of securities, like treasury securities or mortgage-backed securities. They made these long duration loans at low interest rates uh, while their deposit rates are at risk of increasing as the Federal Reserve increases interest rates. And those long duration securities have already lost a lot of value because you know interest rates aren't that low anymore. Uh, so one of the questions you can ask is who's on the other side of that type of problem? You know, if the banks are in trouble because they borrow short and lend long, who borrowed long? And one of the answers is is homeowners. I mean American homeowners are, you know, um, uh, locked in very, very low, long duration mortgages. So many of us are doing pretty fine in that environment. But the other answer is that uh, a number of non-financial companies, they locked in you know, 10, 20, 30 year uh, bonds trading at very low interest rates. And those are now just sitting on their balance sheet kind of locked away and they're submerged below the inflation rate and they're submerged below what you can earn on, on T-bills uh, in many cases. And so those companies are sitting pretty well. And enterprise products partners is one of those examples where they have they have you know their debt you know they they have obviously they do pipeline they're very asset heavy in business like a utility and so they they need to use financing for that but because they have among the highest credit ratings in the industry 
they were able to lock in debt with an average duration of 20 years and a pretty low interest rate. Uh, and so they're, they're basically in the opposite position from what we see with a number of these banks that are having problems. And so I, I, I think that basically these types of income producing um, assets that had obviously a very difficult period in this in you know the past decade or so, I think they're they're better positioned for the next decade going forward. Obviously, you want to diversify. You don't want to have too much in any in any one area. Um, but I think that there are a number of high quality equities that, despite you know still high equity valuations in general, um, you know that not all areas are highly valued. So you know when you're buying something for less you know uh, less than ten times. Earnings when you have a, a sustainable high dividend yield. Uh, this one also has the highest distribution coverage in its history. Um, you know because they've become very self-financing, and so basically the the risk reward of a diverse basket of maybe twenty stocks like this is is still pretty attractive in this environment. So that's pillar one. Pillar two is things like commodities and hard money. So let's start with the chart on the right. This shows the five-year rolling growth rate of oil prices in blue. And it shows inflation, uh, the same, you know, five-year rolling inflation uh, uh, in orange. And obviously, we see a very strong correlation. Inflationary decades have been decades of of high oil prices. Uh, you know, the the prices we saw last year, it's kind of like, uh, you know, you ain't seen nothing yet. I mean, this is just kind of a a rebound from this low period. We actually haven't seen super high oil prices yet. Um, I, I think there's a risk of that, you know, in the years ahead. Um, and so obviously there's a very strong correlation and these environments tend not to be the best for equities. I mean, this was this, you know, this is World War One, this was World War Two, this was the 1970s, which was obviously a very bad environment for both equities and bonds, but but good for commodities. The 2000s were an interesting one because it's it's the one time where we didn't really have a super strong correlation. Obviously, there was some correlation, you had rising inflation. But it, it wasn't the magnitude that you'd expect from an oil price spike this big. And that's in large part because we had so many disinflationary offsets. That was kind of peak globalization. We were outsourcing everything to China. Uh, so we didn't really have that kind of wage increase that we're normally used to in these types of environments. Um, and so we really had a lot of disinflationary offsets that let us avoid some of the, the worst effects from inflation, which I think are unlikely to be repeated should we have another kind of energy shortage, um, you know, recurring energy shortages this decade. So I, I do think things like energy and commodities are are useful as a hedge. Should we get one of these types of of you know longer periods of you know kind of cyclical inflation? And even in those environments, it's not as though inflation was straight up. There's there's ways of inflation that come and go. Central banks and policymakers try to fight back on it, and then you usually have another run. Besides. Uh, industrial commodities. You can also look at hard monies, which I would I'd mostly put in as, say either gold or Bitcoin, depending on what you like. I, I like a mix of both. Um, right now, for example, you know Bitcoin had this this big period. So the black line here is Bitcoin price. Uh, blue line is um, the average cost basis, on chain cost basis of Bitcoin, which is less volatile. Um, and historically, when the market price drops below the average cost basis, that ends up being a pretty good time to buy. Um, I'm monitoring a lot of things in that space. And right now, you know, we've come off those highs. Uh, we're kind of back down to a full kind of sort of valuation reset. Um, and especially as the Fed is probably going to have to keep supplying liquidity to the banking sector, I think we're probably looking at another uh, pretty good you know, three to five year period for Bitcoin. Obviously, you want to manage the volatility. You want to manage the position. But these, basically, these types of hard assets, what they don't do is they provide they don't provide income. But what they do is they they give us some protection against interest rate risk, inflation risk that can affect our other assets that that generally prefer a period of disinflation. The last portfolio is cash equivalents. I mean, the last pillar in the portfolio is cash equivalents. And those generally hold up better in inflationary environments than long duration uh, fixed uh, income assets because they don't have the price risk. They Their, their yields reset uh, more frequently. Um, and you know, this, for example, the, the purple line is the, the Bloomberg one to three month T-bill ETF. And so it's very short duration treasuries uh, among the lowest risk assets that you can hold on a nominal basis. And generally in these higher, you know, the, the orange line here is federal funds rate, so the Fed's rate. Generally in these higher rate environments, uh, obviously, you know, T-bills are accumulating um, 
nominal price gains, right? Because they're actually yielding something that's that's better than zero. And these types of zero rate environments, uh, obviously it's very poor for this type of asset because not only are they not earning anything, but there's a very small expense ratio. So you actually can you know slowly lose value um, you know while holding it. And it's basically just kind of a, a dead asset. Whereas, you know, in these types of environments, you're actually getting paid somewhat, um, you know, to, to hang on to this. There's an option, you know, there's an opportunity cost. Um, and so when you can get paid, you know, 4% from holding T-bills, it might or may not keep up with inflation, but it helps give you protection against the volatile swings that we can get in our equities, the volatile swings we can get in, in commodities. Obviously, commodities are very volatile. And by having kind of a, a balanced portfolio that consists of some of these assets, um, I think that's one of the better, at least frameworks that investors can consider when trying to figure out how they're going to navigate this decade. Because this is not a decade where certainty is likely to be rewarded. Uh, I think you know uh, investors are going to get whipped around quite frequently. Um, I think there's going to be a bunch of nonlinear actions, basically things that are, you know, we've already seen the past three years, things, you know, the word unprecedented has become a pretty common term used in finance. I mean, you know, for example, last year was the the worst ever year for long duration bonds. Um, I, I don't think the number of unprecedented things are over yet this decade uh, when we're in an environment that looks like this. Um and so I think basically you have to keep your head on a swivel. You have to be diversified um, and you have to have a lot of humility as you navigate this challenging decade. And I think that something like the three pillar portfolio or, you know, other sort of frameworks that, that you know, generally make use of, of those major um, asset types, uh, I think are likely to be um, useful to have this decade. So I'm happy to take any questions um, and, and elaborate any more um, if we have time. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. That was a fascinating presentation. So um, our first question here is, do you mind sharing your outlook on natural gas and a possible move back up in UNG? Sure. So natural gas is a extremely, extremely volatile um, asset because not only are you betting on production levels, uh, you're also betting on the weather. Uh, the weather is obviously notoriously hard to predict. Uh, generally, when it's, when it's this beaten down, it starts getting attractive. Um, uh, you know, I'm pretty bullish long term on natural gas. I don't try to predict six month price swings because uh, I don't try to predict the weather. Um, the longer term structural trend for natural gas. So right now, so not compared to say something like oil, which is pretty globally fungible, natural gas is not very globally fungible because transportation costs are such a high percentage of its of its cost. Um, and you know, but it's basically much harder to transport natural gas. You either need a pipeline um, or you need to to you know freeze it, which is, you know, those facilities are billions of dollars. You need specialized ships, specialized facilities to freeze it, transport it, unfreeze it, and get it to where it's going to be in the form of you know LNG. Um, over the next several years, we're expecting uh, significant LNG export capacity. To, to you know keep increasing from the United States. And that should increasingly narrow the gap between foreign natural gas prices and US natural gas price. Basically, it should make it more fungible. So Europe, Japan, these countries have much higher LNG costs, um, you know, natural gas costs compared to what we pay for in the United States. And that'll likely continue to be the case, but that the, the sheer size of that spread is likely to come down. And so I think that I think natural gas has tailwinds in the year ahead. As these export facilities come online and as U.S. natural gas prices are able to, to kind of catch up with the rest of the world and maybe bring those other the world prices down a little bit. Um, but I, I think you have to position yourself so that you don't get wiped out with like a, you know, a, a violent six month move that, that goes against you. It, it's kind of one of those trades that, that has the nickname Widowmaker for a reason, just because people almost every year you hear about some fund getting wiped out because of a, a natural gas move to the upside or the downside. So you have to be very careful with that kind of uh, uh, asset. All right. Thank you. What percentage of each of the pillars do you recommend? I think that that's very individual specific. I mean, I think the, the right answer for a 25-year-old is going to differ than the right answer for a 75-year-old. Um, obviously, if the, the older an investor is, the, the more they have to concern themselves with volatility. And so something like the, the cash equivalent section is likely to be larger. Uh, someone who's younger, 
uh, you know, volatility is less of an issue. They're more interested in, say, total returns uh, and avoiding total capital loss. Um, and so they they can afford to to push out further in the equities and the commodity space. Um, so I really think you have to ask yourself what kind of volatility um, you're willing to absorb, and then also I mean what do you, what are your areas of expertise or interest? I mean this is just kind of a, a broad framework, and obviously you know some investors might be more knowledgeable on natural resources, some might be more knowledgeable on equity, some might be more knowledgeable on, on some other area, um, and so they want to lean into things that they know better. Um, so I, I really think that, that that's uh, uh, investor dependent. All righty. So our next question, uh, Elena says, thank you for a great presentation. What do you think about metal futures, copper and silver particularly? Uh, so I'm I'm pretty bullish on most commodities this decade. Uh, we're seeing interesting shortages in the um, <coughs> physical copper market. Um, again, these can be quite volatile. Right now, silver is historically pretty cheap relative to copper, relative to oil. Um, I, I do expect these these things to do pretty well. My overall commodity exposure is very broad. I have energy exposure. Um, I have gold exposure. I have silver exposure. Um, I have some copper exposure. I'm very bullish long term on it. Um, uh, I have Bitcoin exposure. I have you know, diversified, um, I've, you know, coal exposure, basically just diversified set of commodities, uh, uranium as well. Um, because I, I normally when you have a, 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 a bullish decade for commodities, um, usually it's most of them are doing well. They, they tend to go up and down in, in relative unison. Obviously one year you can have a good copper year and a bad oil year and vice versa. Uh, but when you're thinking in terms of structural, you know, five, seven year, um, price moves, generally see a lot of correlation. Um, and so I, I've kind of spread out my bets and I'm, I'm bullish on a, on a great number of commodities. All right, thanks. And what do you think of REITs, industrial, multi, residential, and office? Uh, I think you have to be very careful with them. Make sure you know what you own. Um, I'm cautious about office, commercial property in general. Um, I think that's, you know, we just technology change. We have a little bit of a, a supply and demand shift for that type of property. Um, I, I think, you know, say warehouse REITs are interesting if you can get them at the right price. Um, you also want to look at, you know, how well did the REIT lock in super low uh, long duration debt uh, relative to its assets? Um, so, you know, I, I have some REIT exposure. It's not an area that I'm super excited about. Um, it's not an area that I have a, a ton of extra, say, expertise in. So I, I've, I've maintained a relatively neutral view on, on REITs. All right. So Tim's asking, uh, so great presentation. Can you comment on your recent tweet about the price action in Japanese bond yields? Sure. So we, um, during the recent um, uh, uh, kind of banking fiasco, uh, one of the interesting things we saw over in Japan was that uh, Japanese bond yields dropped from 0.5% down to 0.3%. Um, and, you know, Japanese bonds were yield capped at 0.5%. Uh, and so, you know, for, for a while, they wanted to go higher than that, and they, they weren't allowed to. It's, it's kind of like, um, you know, if you go look at uh, this chart again, this yield curve control environment, Japan's doing this, right? So they're they're just firmly capping the yields, even when inflation's above their target. And basically, what it does, it, it takes the, um, you know, it, it takes things out out on the onto the currency. Uh, but what we saw uh, this past week was capital move back to Japan. You know, uh, Japan Japanese investors own a lot of foreign assets, um, and so generally in risk off environments, you see a lot of capital move back to Japan. And so you actually saw a, a, a drop in, in Japanese bond yields, even though Japanese inflation is still very much above target. And so basically it was indicative of a risk, risk off view, uh, somewhat of a temporary disinflationary view, and some of the implications for U.S. assets. Because if foreign investors are pulling away uh, from U.S. assets, um, you know, that's that's obviously not good for the next, say, five-year performance of, of U.S. assets. So it's something I continue to monitor um, to see if 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 Japanese yields start staying below the 0.5% yield cap uh, on their own accord, um, that gives us informational value because that basically is, 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 is pointing towards some degree of disinflation and some degree of risk off. Whereas if they go back up to the yield cap, 
uh, and they're trying to go higher, but they're capped. Uh, basically, that's a that's a more inflationary view, uh, and that means basically a lot of Japanese capital is trying to look elsewhere. All righty, thank you. Uh, do you happen to have one or two favorite equities as far as being at a great entry price right now for a long term position? Uh, so I I used. Um, Enterprise product part is an example because I think it fits that bill. I, I've, I've, you know, I've, I've kind of made the point before that I'm, I'm sort of using this as my baseline. It's like, you know, if you can get seven percent yields, twenty five consecutive increases, locked in fixed rate debt, diversified asset base, uh, you know, that's kind of my hurdle rate for when I look at other equities. I'm like, you know, what, what is better than that in this environment? And I'm, of course, I'm not comparing it to say past, you know, this, and again, this wasn't really the fault of the company. This was just the fault of the market for getting it overvalued. The company did this, the stock did this. Um, going forward, I think the company's going to keep doing this. And I think the stock now that it's down here, you know, I think we're going to chop along, uh, you know, grind maybe slowly higher while paying, you know, seven plus percent yields. Um, so I think that's a good example. There's a slightly more aggressive one, um, uh, energy transfer. Um, they have historically not been quite as well managed as this one, um, but at, but they're a little bit of a deeper value at the moment. And so you basically have a little bit more return potential, but also more risk potential. Um, so I, that's my other favorite pipeline. Um, I think there's some interesting healthcare stocks like you know Bristol Myers Squibb. They're basically, some of the some more value defensive type of equities. Um, those are you know I I think. Emerging markets are interesting. Um, I've been relatively bullish on India and Brazil. Um, the ETFs for those markets, I think, provide decent exposure. Obviously, you want to be careful with overall exposure to those markets, especially if you're trying to be careful about volatility. But they do help diversify uh, what can otherwise be a pretty U.S.-centric portfolio. So going along with that, Patrick is asking, what's your view on international stocks compared with U.S. stocks in your first pillar? Um, so I, I really think it's going to depend on um, what country you look at. I think, you know, I'm pretty cautious of European equities. Um, China is always a wild card. Um, I think some of the emerging markets are interesting as in small positions. Um, you know, in general, when you have inflationary commodity-driven decades, um, those are generally a, a, a period of, of foreign equity outperformance. You know, the, the past decade was disinflationary, um, and, you know, we had a very strong performance of, of especially large-cap U.S. growth equities. Um, going forward, I'm much more interested in, in certain foreign equities, um, as well as, you know, to the extent that I stay in the U.S., I, I prefer a little bit more value-oriented, not exclusively value, but but a little bit more geared towards value. Th this obviously would cl classify more as a value stock rather than a growth stock. Um, so I, I think it's less of a factor of, of geography and more of a factor of what type of asset you're buying. But if we do get a kind of a, a wholesale global disinterest in, in you know, Say over the past decade, a lot of global capital piled into U.S. assets, so it increased our valuations and our dollar strength. If some of that capital wants to go back home or go elsewhere, um, then we can have a period where both our valuations come down and our our currency does not, you know, do particularly well. Um, and so the dollar value, the dollar performance of foreign equities can get kind of a double boost. Uh, but again, you have to be very careful with what jurisdiction you pick. I mean, you know. China and Europe and Japan have worse demographics than the United States. Uh, Europe's not energy secure. Um, so, you know, there are a lot of landmines out there uh, globally. But I think some of the um, emerging markets are interesting. And, you know, I, I like using Brazil and India as an example because India is very growth oriented. It's never super cheap, although the valuations have come down um, compared to some of their bubble highs uh, and their commodity importer. Whereas Brazil uh, is super cheap, um, more volatile, um, and is a commodity exporter. Uh, and so I, I think having a diverse base of a handful of different um, emerging markets is interesting. I also find Southeast Asia interesting in general. Um, you know, that, that'd be, you know, 
not only India, but it would also include like Thailand, Malaysia, uh, Vietnam, uh, Indonesia. I, I think it's an interesting market. Also, Singapore is a developed country, but they, you know, their banking systems tie into those, the rest of that kind of region. Um, and so I, I think that area is kind of promising as well. All right, thank you. And to wrap things up with one final question, in a retirement portfolio, what suggestion would you have to generate dividend income to live off of? Um, well, I think, I mean, with with pipelines, you have to be careful about um, UBTI. You know, it's a certain type of thing that can trigger a tax event in a retirement account. Uh, some of these are still fine to hold in retirement accounts, but you have to be a little bit more careful. Uh, you know, in that environment, there are ETFs that can hold uh, these types of assets. Um, like the Alarian um, MLP ETF, uh, you know, again, you'll look at, if you look at past history, I mean, it'll, it'll look pretty ugly. I think going forward, it'll be, you know, more attractive. Um, so I would look at those. Um, you know, I think there are, are you know, I like, for example, the Canadian oil sands producers. I mean, they're trading at single digit price to earnings ratios. Um, they pay down a lot of debt. Um, they're buying back shares at at cheap valuations, so they could be very volatile. I have no idea what they're going to do at a twelve month period, but I think that they're well positioned for five years and they they pay pretty good income. Um, I, I think a lot of U.S. healthcare stocks, like Bristol Myers Squibb, for example, are are interesting for that type of um, retirement uh, account. All right. Well, thank you again. We really do appreciate your time today. Yep. Thanks for having me. And thank you for everyone for coming. Uh, obviously, none of this is investment advice, but hopefully it's been helpful for just kind of setting some of the, the groundwork for, for what sort of um, we're dealing with this decade. So thank you, everyone.